Hello, my name is Diana Lindsay and welcome to another Sunbelt Spotlight. Um, I'm really delighted today because this is the first of several series that we have on Native Americans. Uh, it's Native American Month coming up and we are focusing on that and I hope you can join uh, each, each and every one of these lectures that are coming up. Today is pretty exciting. We have Anne Morgan, who's the author of the Geoglyphs of the, South, uh, of the Desert Southwest. And it's um, a real interesting story uh, about Anne and, the, and uh, Casey, Harry Casey, who got into this because it's a story of serendipity. And the serendipity is you never know how life is going to, where are you going to end up, who you're going to meet, and what that future holds. And for Anne, who was always interested in uh, history and graduated from uh, a university, uh, uh, Simmons College in Boston, and in a master's in archivist and curator she be, uh, in library and information science, and became an archivist and curator at the Imperial Valley College. Uh, so she was the head curator uh, putting together all of this archival material when she met Harry and Meg uh, Casey. And they had been for years working with another archaeologist called Javon Werloff, who had done a lot of work in the Colorado desert and had discovered all these geoglyphs out there. Harry was interested in flying. He had his own Piper Cub, and he would fly around the desert and for years and decades had taken pictures of these 10,000 of them. And it was Anne's job to archive all of these. And in looking at this, she realized what a treasure it was and what it, it would be just fabulous to put this all together in a... <laughs> We're so glad she did because... Um, as time goes on, many of these have disappeared, and these uh, photographs that Harry had taken are, are now recorded, and we have these now to look at these magical uh, images that we have out in the desert. And so without further ado, I'd really like to introduce Anne, and she can tell us a little bit more about it. And Anne, take it away. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me today. And thank you, Diana and Rebecca and Lowell and everybody over at Sunbelt for inviting me to do this. Um, so I'm just gonna see and double check that I can get my screen. Okay, so now you should be able to see my PowerPoint. And obviously we start with a shameless plug to show you the cover of the book and how pretty it is. And then uh, we'll get started, and uh, by the the end of the talk, if there's any questions that I haven't managed to cover, then I'll do my best to answer them then. So first, just to kind of give you a rough idea of where we're talking about, uh, if you look at this map here, you see you've got the, uh, the Anza Borrego, you've got the Colorado Desert kind of arrowed in, and that's where we're focusing on. Uh, that's, that's where Harry did uh, the, his flights. Um, so just to, to give you a rough feel of, of where we are in the world, because I know we've got some people from, from out, of, out of state joining us. Uh, so our deserts are places where people go to hike, to play, and to explore. While it might be hard for us to imagine today, People have been living in the San Diego and Imperial County region for more than 10,000 years. They traveled with the changing seasons and food supplies uh, from the Pacific Ocean to the Colorado River, living successfully in areas that modern people might consider nothing but uninhabitable desert. Today, we are fascinated by the tangible evidence of people living here thousands of years before us, and we are constantly trying to understand what those lives were like. One of the most intriguing mysteries of our desert are the hundreds of geoglyphs that span the area. From the Yuha Desert to the Gila River, these figures clearly told stories to the people who built them. This book is a unique collection of aerial photographs resulting from a 35 year long labor of love to document our local geoglyphs. In 1976, pilot and photographer Harry Casey the Imperial Valley College archaeology professor Javon Werloff and local archaeology students began an archaeological project that today we wouldn't consider possible without the use of drones. 
they wanted to use aircraft to locate and photograph the region's ancient geoglyphs. This effort was to prove so successful that it escalated into the first major attempt to record earth and art sites in our desert region. The campaign used 35 millimeter film cameras, topographical maps, handheld magnetic compasses, and an antique 1946 Piper J3 Cub airplane, which Harry cut a hole in the bottom of in order to take photographs while he was flying. From 1976 into the 1990s, Harry photographed and printed nearly 10,000 images and slides. Beginning in 2014, he worked with me to bring this amazing collection to the Imperial Valley Desert Museum archives. He then showed me the research manuscript that he had been working on over the years and asked for my help editing it and getting it published. This book is a unique collection of aerial photographs resulting from this project. Because of the fragility of these geoglyphs and the potential cultural and religious significance of some of them, specific locations are not provided in this book. The intent of the book is to share the beauty of these amazing features through Harry's photographs and his research on the geoglyphs. The goal is to encourage a new generation of researchers to study these sites and the ethnographic and cultural stories behind them. Geoglyph isn't necessarily a term most people use in everyday conversation, and most people I talk to aren't sure they know what a geoglyph is. But if I ask if they've heard of the Nazca Lines in Peru, almost everyone has at least a vague idea of what those are. So the good news is if you have an idea that they are images in the earth, you know what a geoglyph is. And this is a picture of the, uh, the hummingbird geoglyph, I think, uh, in Nazca, which Harry went down there once. And so this is one of his pictures from that trip. Geoglyphs are formed by removing portions of desert pavement in order to form an image. Desert pavement is the name given to the veneer of closely packed pebbles and cobbles that cover much of the desert surface. The pavement provides a contrast to the lighter soil underneath that becomes the design. Most geoglyphs were probably constructed by people using their bare hands, stones, or other tools to scrape away the pavement in particular designs. Occasionally, small designs or portions of a larger figure were tamped in rather than cleared, probably by human feet tamping down the ground repeatedly. And just because I've gotten this question a few times, the woman in this photograph is Meg Casey, who passed away a few years ago. Uh, she was uh, Harry's wife and quite often got um, talked into giving a contrast in size between a person and the size of the geoglyph. So when you see someone in a photograph to give size, it's almost always her. So the next thing that people ask is who made them and why? Were they aliens? Because the geoglyphs are nearly impossible to see when you stand next to them on the ground. So clearly only aliens would be able to see the images as they flew overhead. Geoglyphs are usually situated on flat, dark mesas near permanent water sources, and they were actually designed to be seen from neighboring mesas or standing on other higher ground. Most American earthen art, like the famous rock art, probably connects to ritual ceremonies or the recording of historical, personal, or mythological events. Dance circles are one of the most common earthen art feature that we still see today, and they would have been formed by dancers following one pattern for an extended period of time, creating circles or patterns tamped into the ground. Uh, there were dances for rain, war preparations, celebrations like coming of age, weddings, or other social gatherings. Celestial observations like solstices and equinox were marked locally in different ways often with cairns or specific rock alignments. The Milky Way and constellations were sometimes drawn into the ground to mirror what was seen in the sky. Some geoglyphs may define territory claims. They may have been designed to protect an area or the people in an area from intruders, or they may have been seen as trail guardians. 
One of the biggest modern concerns is that public disclosure of sites of rock art and earthen art would hasten their destru destruction by people going to see them. The Bureau of Land Management in cooperation with the tribes has fenced in many of the more vulnerable geoglyphs for their protection from off-road vehicles and they provide interpretive signage for the visitors. With over 300 geoglyphs in the region, it's obviously not possible for us to talk about all of them in this presentation, but we will look at a few of the more famous or unique sites here. This is the largest geoglyph in the uh, Yuha Desert area. It has more intricate curvilinear and rectangular design patterns than any other site in the region. It was seriously damaged around 1975. In 1981, it was restored with the help of early aerial images, and then it was fenced in by the Bureau of Land Management for its protection. But it was damaged again by off-roaders who took their motorcycles over the fence to drive on the site. Nature has also impacted the site with erosion of the cliff edge that forms one side of the geoglyph. The site today is noticeably smaller than when Harry began to photograph it in 1976. This is uh, traditionally called the power circle. It's about 550 feet long. It was first recorded in 1979. Uh, it was interpreted by Tom Lucas, uh, the last Kwame elder in 1989, who worked a lot with Javon Wurloff and Harry Casey. And he interpreted this site in a really nice quote that Harry shared that I like to use uh, as he said it. He said the land outside of the outer circle represented the power all things possess, the power that enables earthly existence. The power within the outer circle was stronger and was accessible to humans through prayer or spiritual quests. None but a shaman could set foot in the power laden inner circle. At its center, a hub of quartz cobbles evoked the essence of a world forfeit to shamans upon the mythic demise of their creator god. And you can see right in the very center of this, uh, the stones that's are kind of standing up are the quartz cobblestones. This is traditionally called the Schneider geoglyph after one of the archeologists who first recorded it. It's also found in the Yuha Desert uh, and it was interpreted by Steve Lucas who was a Kwame relative of Tom Lucas and also worked a lot with Javon Orloff. Steve Lucas said that he thought this was the largest dance circle west of the Colorado River and that the, uh, if you look at the, the big kind of oval and then the, there's that line right across the center, he said that was a representation of the Milky Way and the neighboring constellations. If you're on the ground at this one, there are actually little rock, uh, not exactly cairns, but rocks very specifically set that uh, apparently Tom says they, uh, they mirror the constellations in the sky along the Milky Way. This was dated in 1995 by Dr. Ron Dorn of Arizona State, who established it to be about 2,790 years old making it the oldest dated geoglyph in the Southwest. The Blythe Geoglyph Complex is the largest and most famous of our areas. The site has been securely fenced. You can see in the picture that these, these guys have little fences around them. And it was given an interpretive signage for tourists by the Bureau of Land Management. It's one where if you go on the Bureau's website, these, they actually have uh, directions to get to that area to, so that people can see it because they are protected with the fences. Uh, but despite BLM's best efforts, like the Yuha geoglyph, tire tracks are quite visible at this site. The humanoid figures are particularly large here, between 105 and 176 feet tall. In 1995, three of the geoglyphs were dated uh, to be between about 1,060 and 1,145 years old, which is a span of at least 135 years 
suggesting that the area has been a significant location for generations along the Colorado River. And this site is, for those of you who don't know Blythe, really very close to the Colorado River. Uh, the Blythe Giants, which is kind of their nickname, were first recorded by a pilot in 1932, and then a ground survey was done by archaeologist Malcolm Rogers in 1939. Between then and the 1950s, the site was heavily vandalized. So in 1957, the vice principal of Palo Verde High School in Blythe worked with a group of student volunteers to restore the geoglyphs based on the original 1932 photos. This is why most of the geoglyphs at this site are so very visible compared to other even younger sites elsewhere. That's, that's one of the first things people say is, well, these, these just jump out compared to some of the others. And that's because they were um, uh, renewed, I guess, in, the, uh, <clears throat> in more recent times. However, the uh, students made some changes from the originals, whether accidentally or on purpose, we don't know. Among other things, the direction of some of the figures' knees and feet were changed. Uh, you can see that in the circle in there. Fingers and toes that were visible in the 1930s were not restored, and the overall figures, like we said before, were sharpened to enhance their visibility. Now, there is one geoglyph that was not restored. It's only about 35 feet tall, so it's much smaller than the other humanoid figures at the complex. And this gives us an idea of what the other figures would have looked like if they had been left alone. The Mojave, Ketchan, and Hopi oral traditions are connected to this site. One version is that the giant figure was created to represent Mustamo, the creator god, in order to help the people get rid of an evil giant who lived on the east side of the Colorado River and had been tormenting them for many years. Once the geoglyph was finished, they had a ceremony, dancing for three days and three nights to gain the courage needed to kill the evil giant. In a different version of the story, the tribes asked for help from the sea god who sent a giant octopus up the Colorado River from the Gulf of California. The giant and the octopus fought and the octopus was able to drag the giant into the river and drown him carried the body back down the river, occasionally holding it up for people to see. Those who witnessed the event celebrated the giant's death by building geoglyphs of the monster next to the river, which is why there are periodic zigzag marks along the Colorado River mesas to commemorate the giant being dragged into the water. And why all the humanoid figures along the river face it feet first. Apparently that is how he was dragged in. In Winterhaven, there's a 75 foot tall guardian uh, dating about 140 years back. It's very, it has a very well-defined trail running north and south across the figure, which was probably there before the figure was built in. And then the figure became the trail guardian for travelers or possibly uh, used as some kind of a territorial marker. Now there is no official reason for the discolored spots around it. But once when a BL, uh, Bureau of Land Man Management archeologist was giving a talk and describing this figure to his audience, a former military pilot claimed that while when uh, they were practicing aerial gunnery in the area, if he and his fellow pilots had extra ammunition, they would occasionally shoot at this figure. I don't know of any archaeology surveys that have been done to confirm or deny this story, but it may happen at some point. This guy here, there are a lot of snake geoglyphs out there, but this uh, is called the Parker snake because he's around Parker, Arizona. He's a 150 foot long rattlesnake. And you don't normally see so uh, very specific details. Like here you can, you can see the tongue, you can see the rattles on his tail. Usually with the snake geoglyphs, you just get sort of an undulating line that makes you think, yeah, that, that reminds me of a snake. 
but uh, as late as 1990, this figure could be seen to have the tongue and the tails. So he also had giant quartz eyes that were said to be so powerful that they glowed in the dark. Drone images that I've seen today only have the body left. The eyes are gone, the tongue is gone, the rattles have disappeared, uh, and we don't know if the image was altered to include the details like the tongue or the rattles, or if those were originally there, and that maybe some of the other snake geoglyphs in the area might have also had those, and those eroded over time. That's kind of one of those mysteries that probably we're never really going to know the answer to. Just like we're never going to know why all of these geoglyphs in our region were made. Maybe, like generations of people after them, the intention behind even one of the geoglyphs here was simply to say, I was here. And even if it wasn't, hundreds or thousands of years later, people are still connecting to the geoglyphs and the people behind them. They are still making geoglyphs today, uh, as these last two have shown. These are very modern versions. I'm sure everybody can, can tell that but they're, they're connecting to whether it's an artistic uh, spirit that the desert has and talks to us or some other way, they, the geoglyphs still inspire us and they still touch us today. And hopefully uh, the ones in this book will sort of touch other people and give some more ideas, uh, showing more people what's out there and, and celebrating what we have right here in America. Um, that's my presentation. So <laughs> I was trying to keep it short so it wouldn't get too boring. Well, thank you very much, Anne. And I forgot to mention to folks that if they are interested in your book and finding out more information, check on our Sunbelt website because we are offering a discount uh, through this month, uh, especially for those that are watching this program and tell others about it because this program will be recorded. And I believe there might be some questions for you too. Great, sure. I, I, see, one, I see one from Mark Womack. How are the geoglyphs dated? That is almost always the very first question that I've gotten. I haven't figured out how to actually put it into the presentation yet. Um, so it's, it is, Almost, I think I can almost every single presentation I've done, that's the first one. Um, the geoglyphs were dated, the, again, this was back in 1995 with a, a carbon 14 dating system. And obviously it wasn't a perfect um, method, but the idea was that the, uh, the veneer of the stones that were picked up and, and moved to create the image, once a stone is exposed to the air, you start getting what we call desert varnish, which is basically all the little organic bits that get blown around in the wind, uh, clay, dust, all kinds of stuff. And that can be dated. So uh, they were dating that. So it gives sort of a, the, um, the earliest, the, the minimum that a rock was exposed. So it's not, it's not a, a perfect dating system, um, but I have not yet heard of a different one being tried. So at the moment, um, that's that carbon 14 is the only one uh, that I'm aware of, of them using. But that's where the dates from Harry's book came from, was from that, that method. Well, I have a question. How, how many sites are there? How many have been recorded? Um, several hundred from the uh, the Yuha, uh, the the Akatio area, almost the Imperial Valley, uh, Imperial and um, San Diego border, uh, to up along the Colorado River. Uh, there's a couple as far up as Anza Borrego a little bit that goes down to, to Arizona. So it's, it's a bit of an area, but there are several hundred. 
um, which is kind of unique. There's actually only about five places in the world that have big concentrations like that. You've got the Nazca Lines in Peru, which everybody has heard of. Um, we're the area that's got the largest in, uh, in, in America, in the United States. Uh, Australia has quite a number of them. Uh, Kazakhstan, and I don't know what the story is behind that. Uh, somebody's asked me that and I, I haven't found out more about it, but Kazakhstan and um, in England, you've got the, uh, like the, the chalk horse and the chalk giant. So it's not, there's not a ton of them in England, but it's, there's a couple. And who was the first to discover these in our desert? Well, I mean, the, the Kumeyaay and the other uh, Native Americans that have been living here for 10,000 years, obviously, they always knew about them because they, they were making them, their ancestors were making them, and they would go back to those sites. Um, in terms of, um, like, archaeologists, it varies a lot. Um, we know that Malcolm Rogers uh, in the, the 30s recorded a lot of them. Some weren't recorded until the 70s or 80s. I mean, there's still, people are still coming across ones that haven't been recorded even to this day. Um, and I guess that's a combination of most of these you do have to see from overhead before you realize what it is that you're looking at the desert just being so vast. Um, it's, it is interesting that they are still uh, recording some, archaeologists are still recording some today, but the, uh, the 20s and 30s, a number of them were really started to, to record. I have a question here from Scott Davis. Has Google been helpful in concealing geoglyphs? Um, in concealing geoglyphs, that's interesting. It's usually people ask the opposite, which is how, uh, how do you find them on Google? Um, and if you know where you're looking, you, especially with the, the Blythe ones, uh, you can see them in, if you're scanning the area. Um, I don't know actually if somebody like the Bureau of Land Management um, asked, asked Google not to, like to blur the area. I don't know if they would have that, um, right isn't really the right word, but uh, if, if they would do that. Um, I, I know a number of people have commented that they will go on Google Earth and um, do, kind of just start scanning around and see them that way. Some of them are still visible that way. Some, unless you really know exactly where you want to look, they are, um, they're faded and eroded enough that you, you don't see many of them that way. Um, I have some other questions from the audience. Are you working with Mexican organizations to collate any information south of the border? With so many geoglyphs identified in the US, it supposes there are more in the undisturbed portions of the Yuha south of the border. There, uh, I know of, of one or two that Harry um, and Jay Von Werloff noted and didn't really take pictures of. Um, they pretty much stuck with the, the Colorado and Yuha on the American side of the border. Um, but I, I agree, definitely there would be some uh, kind of stands to reason on the, the Mexican side because that's such a new artificial uh, line that, you know, the, the geoglyphs would definitely be on both sides. Um, I personally am not uh, I'm, I'm not in a position where I could do work like that. Um, the, the geoglyphs now with the drones are getting more interest. So I think it's very possible that you're going to start to see either the tribes themselves or archaeologists working with, with the tribes and with drones 
to maybe do some kind of a, a project to um, to record all the ones that that can be found. I just I don't know of one that's happening right now. I have another question here that says, can you tell us a bit more about Harry? I am just curious about why he was inspired to do this. If you know, what was his background? His background uh, was, I mean, he grew up in, um, in Imperial Valley. He, his family were farmers. He inherited the farm. Um, but flying was kind of always one of his hobbies, the, the little Piper plane that I showed you guys, that's his plane. Um, and he sort of almost accidentally fell in with the archeology. span He took a, an adult education class through the Imperial Valley College with uh, Javon Werloff, and that was on local archeology span and, and really kind of was like, I, I had no idea that there was all of this history and all of these people that have been living here for so long. And, and so he kind of, he kind of got the bug to find out more about it. And then it, it, it just sort of was one of those perfect matches. Uh, hey, I've got this plane that I own. Why don't we go up and, and look? And it just turned into this this whole project that was um, very unique for its time, but it was it was he it was very accidental. But then he uh, he and Jay became very good friends. So and he a number of of uh, people that would take those classes became good friends. He met his uh, his wife Meg Casey. He met through those classes. So he kind of just got the bug to to get into that and, and start recording the area's history that way. Why don't you tell a little bit about how, what he did to his airplane, so how he took those photographs. So the, the plane is this, it's this little, most normal people would call it a one-seater plane. He has gotten two or three people in if they're skinny enough. Um, I didn't meet him while he was still flying, so I never got I met him, his wife had put her foot down and he wasn't allowed to do that anymore. But um, he would, so he would fly the plane and got to where he could cut a hole in the bottom of the plane. So he could steer with his knees and set his camera up over the hole and take photos while he was flying. And I, I was never told the story, but probably he did not tell his wife about that until he had really perfected the art. Um, but that was that was the setup. He, he took most of the pictures, so you had the, the straight down images instead of, he, some he took out the window, so you got more of a, a side view, but a lot of them he just took straight down like that. Oh, and this was all in the days pre-digital uh, photography, so he never knew what the photos were going to look like until he went back home and developed the photographs. I, I have kind of a follow-up question to the airplane. Is there any remnant of the Piper airplane? Um, that's an interesting question. The last time I talked to Harry was a Oh, uh, it was a couple of years ago now, and he still owned the plane. Um, he, I, he obviously had not flown it in a number of years. Um, I'm not sure that it, it could fly anymore at that point, or if it would need some serious restoration efforts. So as far as I am aware, it is still at the Blythe Airport, um, as of the last that I knew. I. I could be wrong, but that was the last that I heard was that it was still at least a physically a plane, if not um, a working flying plane. Um, I've got a couple comments here. Blythe Airport has an aerial tour for pilots of some of the larger glyphs in the region. Viewing by air is really the best way to see the glyphs. That's from Jerome Bishop. And yeah, then definitely. Scott Davis is saying the photographer Mark 
Rudell found one or two geoglyphs that he shared with Jay. And of course, the circle spoke geoglyph was found by recreational hikers. Are there new generations of people still researching and discovering new works? Yes. Uh, and again, a lot of that goes back to drones becoming more popular. When I was still working with the Imperial Valley Desert Museum, we had a couple of people uh, who, who had drones who were really getting into uh, wanting to, to fly over sites and see what they looked like now, comparing them with Harry's photos, um, wanting to see were there still other ones out there because people are out hiking and they do still occasionally uh, find some. I, I was talking with the museum the other day. Um, somebody had been out uh, right, right on the Mexican border and found uh, the pieces of one that was still there, the rest of it had been destroyed that, uh, that, that had not, nobody knew about. So it, there, there are still definitely some being found out there. Um, and I, I think that combination of, of still finding a few new ones and the more accessibility that drones are giving today. I'm hoping that that pushes a lot more people, uh, a lot more archeologists to really want to study these and maybe find some new ones. Uh, I mean, they're still finding uh, geoglyphs down in Nazca. There was a story on the news the other day that they had found a new one. It was like 2000 years old. Um, so there, there still definitely are surprises out there. <laughs> Well, I, I do we have any more questions? If um, if not, I want to I want to thank you, Anne, for joining us for a spotlight talk, and I want to invite everybody else. Next week we have another speaker. In fact, we have a couple of different speakers. We have a brand new book on California Indian basketry, and the author and editor uh, are going to be there, and we're going to have a sneak peek at the pages because the book doesn't arrive at the Sunbelt Warehouse until December. But we're going to be offering a, a pre-publication discount, and you get to look at that sneak peek. But that's next Thursday at 11 o'clock for another Sunbelt Spotlight. So please join us. And Anne, thank you so much for this really interesting talk. And, and again, encourage everybody to, um, you know, to get the book. You, know, you can get it through us through our website at a discount, or you can get it at any quality bookstore or your online uh, favorite place to shop, but please buy Anne's book and and uh, and uh, we encourage you to um, to learn more about our Native Americans through uh, the many lectures that we're going to be having in the next several weeks. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you guys so much, and thank you for having me. Thanks everybody. <laughs>